At first glance, the SF23 may seem like a bit of a continuation and carryover from last year's Ferrari. However, once you start to dive a little bit deeper and look a little bit closer at what's going on on this car, you can see there's a whole host of super intricate and very clever aerodynamic details. In this video, we'll walk from the front to the back of the car, going through all those different details, what they are, what they do, and how they work. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19, and 20 Formula 1 seasons. I now work as an aerodynamics consultant, designing race car aerodynamics packages for cars in all different classes all around the world. This video, of course, comes with my standard disclaimer of F1 cars are aerodynamically complex. We can't tell fully what's going on just by eye, but we'll certainly give it a good shot. Now let's get to the analysis. Starting with the front wing, the thing that's probably caught people's attention the most are the addition of the Mercedes style slot gap separators. Now you're specifically allowed to have on the wing three brackets to cover off the pivoting system, and then you're allowed eight uh, static brackets that are slot gap separators. So then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mercedes tried these out last year and they weren't legal. Why are they legal this year? Well, the rules changed a little bit here. Previously, these had to be only for structural reasons. They couldn't be for aerodynamic reasons. That particular clause was struck out. So now these can be used. What do they actually do? Well, obviously we've got an outwashing component to this vein. Now there is something to be said for the fact that the flows in this area are gonna naturally be outwashing because we're gonna be migrating from the high pressure on top of the wing here to a lower pressure where the wing is more backed off of the outboard portion. So there's gonna be an outwash that way anyway. So these are already going to be in a flow that is traveling essentially in this trajectory. Um, but what these will be is they'll be more outwashing than that. And by being more outwashing than the, the local flow, uh, what they'll do is they'll generate little vortices off the top like that. And they will also boost the outwash in this particular region. So we'll basically have these five vortices here. And these five vortices will presumably uh, work to power up any structures on the underside of the wing that might be rotating in the opposite direction. Like for example, this bit here where the wing starts to ramp down towards this flatter section here, we're probably gonna see some degree of sheet vorticity being shed off here that's trying to rotate this way. And then we'll be generating outwash with these veins on the top and they'll be rotating in the opposite direction. We'll get a counter rotating vortex pair of sorts. It's not quite a pair because there's obviously quite a few vortices involved. And this will generally drive the flow between them in that particular direction and drive the flow on top that way and the flow on the bottom that way. So having these outwashing elements probably just powers up that lower system and it also generates a previously not really available counter rotating vortex at the top. Now this is presumably a, a tire wake management device, uh, but of course any benefits of it have to be balanced with the additional loss of having devices that are shedding vortices where the, each one of those vortices has a little bit of loss. So that could affect devices further downstream. Mercedes claimed that these weren't a huge benefit, they weren't a game changer or anything like that, but it'll be interesting to see how many of these pop up across the grid now that it's a legal device. Looking at the front wing in general too, not just the vortex generators, there's a few other details that are quite interesting. Obviously the outboard portion, the end plate is all pretty vanilla, the tips are pretty vanilla, although we now have an S-shaped uh, dive plane on the outside here, but that's nothing too fancy. We've covered all that sort of stuff before. What interests me is the fact that Ferrari uh, previously ran this first element into the nose, uh, and now you can see that it's fully disconnected. And it's been really interesting because obviously some teams have gone from connected to disconnected, other teams have gone from disconnected to connected. So there's no clear optimum and no clear winner here. Uh, it's obviously just a trade of cleanliness under the nose and losses under the nose uh, versus maximizing uh, loading in the center by decreasing porosity. The other thing that's interesting to note on this wing is the width of the relatively downwashing section that's out near the tire. You can see that we keep pretty flat for this whole portion here. We're quite level. And then when, when we're just sort of inboard of the tire, that's when we start to kick and ramp up. You can see it's quite a, a noticeable change. And that kind of shows to me that they're really prioritizing having this area downwash here. So they're probably trying to maximize their squirt management along there, or maybe they're trying to boost the effective uh, strength of the vorticity where you start to ramp up into this more cranked region here. Looking a bit further back, you'll see similar to the Haas, we've now moved the track rod off the, the cake tin scoop and down onto near the lower wishbone to form a cascade. You can check out my Haas video for more information on how that worked with the lower suspension cascade and the changes to the scoop. But I suppose this change wasn't super surprising given the relationship between Haas and Ferrari. 
Moving further rearwards again, the floor leading edge and barge board section on this car is also quite interesting. You'll see that it's pretty much the opposite of that Aston Ferrari I was discussing in the Aston video, where we have quite a high inboard region and a much lower outboard region, which with much more of that barge board top exposed there. You'll see here how the floor comes up and then it almost looks like it might dip down slightly towards the center line. Now, in terms of what they're trying to do with this particular raise, I would say that what they're trying to do is they're, they're probably trying to maximize the mass flow into the, the center of the floor, uh, into the, the channels and the tunnels that are going through here. They're obviously prioritizing getting that in, even if it means they've got to sacrifice a little bit of local load on the leading edge, because obviously if you pull this leading edge up, you are decreasing the relative angle of attack on the leading edge, so that they're, they're gonna lose a little bit of that load, but then they might have a healthier floor vortex system, and they may see gains along the entire floor as a result of this. Out of the barge board, you'll see that it's a really cranked tip out there, similar to what we discussed on the Haas, which is going to, of course, power up this vortex here that's rolling off its edge, which will drive more outwash along the floor. It might drive more outwash into the wake wherever it sits off the side of the car. But the trade of this is, of course, that it will locally generate suction on the top surface of the floor and there'll be some loss from it that could potentially be ingested further downstream. But see, where this car starts to get interesting is when we look a little bit further inboard and on the top surface of the floor. Because what you'll see here is a little air intake there that no one's really run up until this point. Now in terms of legality, this particular item of bodywork has clearly a very small radius. It's basically sharp at the leading edge. And this tells me that this probably belongs to the section of bodywork that's classed as the mid chassis, because that particular area has almost no rules at all. If you have a look at these two shots, I've basically got over here my legality volumes, and this area in blue is my mid chassis box. And you can see that, that I've highlighted that, and you can see that it flares out along here. So it goes along, back from the nose, and then flares out. So you can see that it would go along here, and it flares out along there. And I think that this vein probably is within that particular box. So what we've got is we've got some form of air intake just under the side pod here. It can't be in the side pod legality box because if it was in the side pod legality box, it would have to have some degree of sizable radius like all the inlet has. So it can't be in that, it's gotta be in one of these other legality boxes. But where does this inlet go? Where is the air going from this? I believe the answer to this lies in the end portion of this same mid legality box. If we look from the side, what you'll see is that we've got this particular intake down here. And then if we follow the fillet of the carbon through here, it doesn't look like there's a, a duct or anything that's venting just into the rad duct. So I don't think it's part of the main radiator opening. But up further rearwards, you'll see that there's an outlet just up here. Let me show you this from another angle. This outlet sits here along the side of the bodywork and you can see that it's, it's a big old exit right there. Now, one of the things that's notable about this exit is how tight the fillet radii are around it. You have quite a tight corner here, you have a relatively tight corner here, and then you have a very sharp concave corner right there. And this means that again, it can't be in the bodywork legality boxes. If you're in these boxes, you have to have relatively large fillet radii. So it's gotta be a different section of bodywork. Again, I think, that this is the mid bodywork. If you have a look at this highlighted region, you'll see that it tapers out wide and then it forms this big block here. And that is where I think our exit is in this rearwards portion. Now, you need more than to just be in this particular area for this outlet to work because you don't just need to be able to form a surface, but you need to be able to cut an aperture. And that's where this gray box comes in here because this gray box is the aperture volume. So basically what that is, is that, that shows you where you can physically cut out holes. And these holes have to be for the purpose of allowing cooling. So we've established that we've got a vent somewhere up here and we've got an intake somewhere down here. And somewhere between those two, something is getting cooled because if it was just a straight bypass duct, it wouldn't satisfy the cooling requirement for the aperture rule. However, there's no requirement on how much cooling needs to be done. So for example, you could have a 
cooler in here that has a very coarse fin layout. So it was basically a bypass duct with a cooler in it. Or maybe it's just cooling some electronics that would still be classed as cooling. So you could get something that is largely a bypass duct and just fits the technical definition of a cooling duct. But why would you want this? Why would you want a duct that can flow air from here up to here? Well, as I've discussed in some of my videos from last year, we get a lot of chassis losses building up along the side of the chassis. Now, obviously these losses are gonna move downstream and they will at some point work their way around the side pod and probably get ingested by the floor or maybe they'll just thicken the boundary layer along here that can make life worse for all the rearwards aero devices. Now, Ferrari has shown that they don't care about a few losses being kicked up high. They've got all their louvers up here, all their cooling goes up high and around here. So they don't mind adding a tiny bit more loss there. But what this can do is, is that we can use the, the outlet over here to drive it so that we suck in these losses down the bottom here into our intake there. So it basically just bleeds off the thick boundary layer along here bleeds that off, sucks it through this duct, then kicks it up here. And what that means is that we will get cleaner flow all down here, which will improve the performance of our low down devices in our floor, which is obviously a goal that Ferrari is going for because they've been very deliberate about keeping their losses high and keeping everything down low relatively clean. So this is one potential way in which this duct could be used. Another way that it could be used, which I find somewhat less likely, is that if the air down the bottom here was already quite clean, it could blow up and be used as a bypass to give a clean jet of our air up here. I find that quite unlikely because I think that if you had clean air here, which you don't, you would end up with that clean air going around the side normally and that would be quite nice. And I don't think, given where they put all their cooling, that having a very clean flow here would be particularly useful. And of course, you still have to pass some sort of cooling item here. So I don't think they're doing it that way. I think they're using it to suck up these losses and these boundary layer losses along the side of the chassis here, very much in a similar way to how the S ducts used to work, just bigger. The side pod design in general is very similar to last year, but they've smoothened everything out a lot more. They're far less bluff. They used to come down quite aggressively and bluffly there, and then sit as a large flat surface out here before cutting in at the back. They are now smoother, much smoother through the main area. And one of the things that gives away how much they've had to pull in this particular side pod is actually the cyst bulge just here. If you have a look, they have quite a large and ugly blister for the side impact structure where it comes through there. And while that blister itself would not be ideal for airflow. Obviously they have found performance in pulling back the side pod surface and smoothing out this region. You also note that just down low at the back, they've pulled in a lot more here. They've really smoothed out this area and tried to make this less curvature here at the end. They used to go back very far and then quite aggressively in. They've obviously tried to smooth out everything and make for a much gentler path for the air through here. So again, following a philosophy that a lot of the other teams are going for, where they're really trying to get a smooth and clean path for the air through here. Obviously trying to maximize the, uh, the total pressure and the flow energy at the rear of the floor. Up the top, we very much maintain the philosophy of last year's Ferrari with uh, cooling louvers going on the top, although our panel layout's a little bit different instead of being a sort of continuous curve through here, we have it broken into two separate panels. But one thing I'd like to really draw your eyes towards is how tight it is at the rear. You can see how much it comes in here. There's almost no exit here. We do have a little bit of an aperture around the suspension where there'll be a, a little bit of uh, loss and cooling loss escaping through there. But in general, it's just super tightly packaged. And unlike a lot of the other teams, which are now going for this downwash style where they bring in clean air from this region and pull it down to the floor, Ferrari is still very much running on this approach of taking the clean air from the sides, keeping the tire wake at the front pushed out, and then take this clean air from the sides, go and pull that back in at the back, and then keep that tight and use that to feed the beam wing and the diffuser outboard devices. I think an argument can be made for either setup on, on any of the cars. And I think a lot of it's gonna depend around what the front wake profile looks like, whether that's encroaching around more on the top, whether that's being pushed out to the side. I think that that is going to affect a lot the choice of the bodywork. So I don't think it's clean cut like one design is superior to the other or anything like that. But what I will say is that if the Ferrari is working properly and this curvature along here is sufficiently gentle, that they're getting minimal losses along the bodywork and they've got a nice clean flow going to the rear, this should give you a really good general flow quality at the back of the car.
Looking a bit higher up at the halo, I'd like to just point out the array of winglets going on, and in particular, these large bridging winglets out here. They actually send to the full width of the mid chassis box that I was talking about earlier. You'll see that they come all the way out to here, and that's where our cooling louver exit ends there, the, uh, the inboard one that we discussed at length before. And what you'll see is these winglets are a downwashing winglet that extend all the way to the legality box, so they're really trying to maximize the downwash here, and they've also got this free winglet tip. They could have just ended the winglet here, but they've decided to go the full way out. So they're going to be getting some form of vortex that's going to be rotating that way out there. Now, a lot of this downwash and all that is probably to control the cockpit losses, any losses from here that are going to be spilling out. They're probably trying to control that with this winglet and suppress those as much as they can. But then maybe this outboard vortex is trying to get a bit of uh, localized downwash on this particular portion of the bodywork as we move further rearwards and just enact an overall downwash down the bodywork as we go along the back. It would be a fairly subtle effect given the small nature of the device, uh, but it would be an effect nonetheless. The other option is, is that they're actually trying to maximize the local downwash by extending to full span. So they're going out to full span to maximize the local downwash and the vortex is just an unintended and unwanted side effect of that. So that is also an option that's on the table. Finally, I just want to discuss an item that's not really well shown uh, on the studio shots and can only really be seen on the track shots where there's a little bit more light. Around the floor edge, you'll see that there's no obvious floor edge wing and we've got quite a raised section here. So I'm gonna hazard a guess that they're gonna have an ice skate style geometry in here somewhere like was run last year for a certain period. And that's probably what's going on underneath the floor. But that's not the main thing that intrigues me. What I'm interested in is actually this cutout setup at the rear here, because what you've got is they've essentially gone through and they've notched it twice. And what it appears that they've done is they basically managed to flare out along here. So you can see that's flared a bit and they've gone through and basically turned this out. So that this is like a, a vein that sort of nose out and they've got this flare here so that this edge is also nose out. So if you look from above, basically you would have the floor edge comes along here and it cuts in and then basically it would cut back and that's where the cutout is. And then you would have one vein like that and then one vein like that for the floor edge. And what this would do is that it would help clean up a lot of the edge structures. And the reason that would be the case is because in this portion of the floor, you would typically see a lot of inwash being pushed basically inwards from the tire. So you'd see a lot of inwash. There's a lot of suction over here and a lot of expansion in the diffuser. So it's drawing a lot of air in here. And if you just had from top view, a floor edge that went along and then was just a square edge, what you'd get is you get a really lossy vortex roll up along here that would likely blow up. So a lot of the teams managed this last year by putting in this cutout here to give it a fresh edge that it's starting on. But by having two edges, we can actually shed that load across multiple edges. So we've got, obviously, we've shed the vorticity across multiple edges, like we've been trying with a lot of things in addition to any upstream tunnel vorticity. But we also allow us to slat our secondary edge with our primary edge. So overall, this system should be much more tolerant to heavily in washing flows. Now that is helpful in terms of uh, susceptibility and robustness to varying ride heights at the rear, but also it should just be a real benefit in terms of cleaning up this floor edge and the floor edge vortex system there, which generally speaking, cleaning up and reducing the potential for vortices to blow up in this area is a bonus for overall diffuser expansion. So that's what I think they're achieving here. And I think it's a really cool way of doing it within what are really quite tightly restricted rules in this area. Well, that's all for this analysis video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what you'd like to see from me next, and hopefully I'll see you next time.